company after they sort of retaliated against journalists who gave negative reviews to it, which sort of reminded me of thinking around the same time that Apple was doing something like censoring reviews it wasn't too happy with. It's just, it's really disturbing. Sometimes they do a reward and punishment thing where they say, well, if you say good things about it, we might offer you a job or we might send you exclusive reviews or exclusive interviews. And, you know, and, and, and this is how they play. They basically reward if you give a good review, if you're actually being honest about something, being a piece of something. Uh, well, no, that, I, I, and, and that's the thing. I, it, it's a thing. Go ahead. So all I was all I was going to say was um, speak to somebody who had the has the opportunity to purchase uh, Duke, Duke Nukem Three. It, is it actually out yet? Has it been released? Uh, I haven't been paying it much attention. Do we know if it's actually come it out? It has been uh, released to reviewers at least. Oh, uh, right. Right. Uh, I don't uh, think it's supported in Linux, but I see some Linux sites mentioning that. I think that's nostalgia that well, I, I used to play. I, I mean, that. the original Duke Nukem I thought was just ridiculous and silly anyway, um, and I, I've got no interest in the latest version. I, I don't see many people... But you could fly. Them. That was one of the first shoot 'em up things where you can also go up and fly and shoot mm. from the sky. That, that's, Fantastic. That's what that yeah. and that, that, is that a good thing? Um, no, I, I was never interested in the franchise. I found it very silly, very... Um, I found it quite quite insulting at times. I, I thought it was a, a bit of a silly franchise. But certainly from what I've seen, I'm not seeing the excitement for the PS3 version like uh, other titles that are coming this year, which are eagerly well, anticipated. Well, I think you can thank Sony for that. You know, that's... Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's we've already got a thousand and one shooters that are virtually identical to the same the same ethos that Duke Nukem runs off. Fair enough, they might be having the same type of sexism in in their games, which Duke Nukem is alleged to have in it. And uh, but we've got Killzone Three, which is an immensely popular title, which is still going strong, and that was released about three months ago. We've got Space Marine coming up, which everybody is eagerly anticipating. So it'll be the first. Games Workshop first person shooter for the PS3 and I don't see a lot of excitement for Duke Nukem 3 there's a pass- passing sort of uh, interest in it in, in respect of what, where it's come to now after the PC origins and, but I, I don't see a lot of excitement for it and uh, I've certainly seen some people saying not too pleasant things about it as well um, so we'll have to wait and see like I said I haven't been following it so I don't know if it's been released yet I, think, so- it's been sad. I think it's become such a meme now an internet meme now so everybody talks about yeah. Duke Nukem Forever and people just make jokes about it he was, uh, so that's, I mean, I, th- I think what what it was with Duke Nukem, unlike the Quakes or your um, Wolfenstein or your Dooms, I think the thing about Quake, uh, Duke Nukem and the selling point at the time was he was quite controversial because at that time, when I certainly had it on the PC, and this was going back to the 90s, it was the, the amount of computer games with levels of violence and bad language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it quite had a, uh, like strippers and things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it was the unpolitically correct yeah. game. And it, it, it just kind of went viral for all the middle schools and high schools back at a time before there was really any such thing as viral. Yeah. But I mean, t- by today's standards, it's pretty tame. Um, I mean, we see plenty of examples. I think the one good thing that I would say about Duke Nukem is at least the violence was never realistic. It was always over the top. It was always... Well, and that's the thing. Based on what I've seen, at least the advertisements and the screenshots I've seen, it looks like it, it's it's modern. It's modern polygons, but it looks as cheesy as it ever did, mm. which mm. is one of those <laughs> things I'm like, that'll either work to its advantage and everybody will go on this nostalgia trip, or everybody will go, what the? Yeah. Well, if you want, if, if people listening to the show want the Goblin recommendation for the PS3, my, my best advice would be get yourself Killzone 3 and save your money for Space Marine. Um, I believe Space Marine is going to be a cracking title this year and Killzone 3 is absolutely fantastic. So that, that's my recommendation. Um, anyway, we'll move on from games because I don't think, yeah. uh, have a lot of place on this show. And, I, uh, I believe, uh, the team has been working and actually exploring uh, Magia for a while. I'm not sure we did cover this before, but I, I found a review today uh, she published yesterday. Uh, it's called First Impressions, possibly the best KDE for uh, 4.6.x distribution to date. Uh, so I haven't tried this distribution. It's supposed to be very closely tied to the developments in Mandriva, which hasn't been as far as I know, Mandriva 2011.0.1 hasn't been released yet. Uh, but that's supposed to come with one of the latest KDE versions. 
Uh, and this review is extremely positive about it. Uh, I believe Tim is not a big fan of KDE, and just before we began this show, we had this conversation. <laughs> it's a fair conversation, and myself and uh, Rusty, we, we quite like KDE. I, I find it to be uh, irreplaceable for my needs. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate that, you know, I know some people don't find it to be visually attractive. They think it's similar to Windows. They they think it's really hard to work with it. And well, you know, and I, I find I always find that insulting when people say KE hey, is a little Windows. But I'm like, you realize all of that stuff that you know now that makes it look like Windows was in KE two to oh. three years before, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, when I when I say that comment, I mean it, it doesn't. Uh, the fact that it looks like Windows really bears. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether it was looking like Windows before Windows or after Windows. It just looks like Windows, and that's uh, I don't like. Yeah. I mean, I'll just quote myself here actually, because I, I was desperately trying to pull up my re- my review of uh, Magia when Roy was talking, and this is this is probably sums up my impressions of KDE quite well. So I'll quote myself here, and I'll put the link to show notes so people haven't already read it. Um, just bear with me a second, and I've lost it again now. In the uh, I should just yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, got it, got it, right. Here we are. this is what I said, right. The plethora of GUIs and utils to customise your system in comparison to, say, GNOME is akin to travelling from the UK to America via Saturn. Now, that's my overall summary. Everything in KDE is a chore. Everything is contained within sub-menus, within sub-menus, within sub-menus, within which tabs. Is good, which is a good thing. Is it, though? Because at the end yeah. of the day... Uh, KDE 3 was, was said to be too complicated, even though they did try to simplify by moving things to a distant tab somewhere so it doesn't confuse users. And KDE 4 was trying to simplify this in the same way you could argue that GNOME 3 is trying to simplify further and dump <laughs> down the experience with GNOME 2. Uh, what happened was with KDE 4, many people were complaining the, in the early versions, of, you know, how do I do this, how do I do that, I could do it in KDE 3 and go back to Trinity. Uh, so they put down the, they put back the functionality. They, they put a lot more than used to exist. If you actually look for all kinds of new options, it's pretty amazing. I really, really love KDE for why it allows me to do, and I think lots of people don't realize what it can do. You okay. can actually demonstrate it to them. Uh, the, the thing is, it has become a bit more complicated now, and you could say KDE 4 is in some sense as complicated as KDE 3 was. Maybe slightly better organized. So one of the things they do in the control panels is they allow you to do a preview and see the uh, contents of the of the selections that you have. So you can kind of see a preview of what you will have as options once you click on something without actually clicking on it. Okay. So, so well, well, since I'm in the minority here and uh, Rusty and Roy are well, both. Uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the other side, I, I, actually, given his complaint, uh, I it's somewhat valid. But one of the things I see most Linux distributions do that go with KDE is they write um, control panel equivalents based on how their distro philosophy is, which simplifies a lot of that. And you have both the stock default KDE one, but quick things you'd want to mess with are all right there. Um, So... um, Looking, but at, at the end of the day, you have to get used to the fact that it's widget-based, which can be a little counterintuitive if you've never messed with it before. You either learn to love it or you hate it. I, I mean, I have to be fair. I suppose that should I have uh, be, been exposed to Linux early on with KDE, then probably I'll be a KDE user now, and it, maybe yeah. it's more... Fun. It is true. In my case, yeah. I was exposed to KDE early on because I was doing mostly development in Linux back in you know, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but, but since I'm in the minority here, um, I'll, I'll make a couple of points because uh, I think these questions need to be answered. So I'm going to try and hopefully put Roy and Rusty on the spot here. Now, if we agree that your desktop is just a launch pad to access your other program packages, packages and programs to do whatever task you're currently doing. I'm not sure I agree with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let, we're not talking now in terms of the specialist user or the user that has a, has a professional task to accomplish. We're talking about an end user. We're talking about a person who has it on the machine who switches it on to boot up a web browser and look at Facebook. Uh, for me, KDE just puts too much, too many options and, and too much fluff in order for users to you know get get their head around their um, the, the customization. I would argue that there is nothing that KDE can do for the average user that GNOME can't. 
And if either of you two can put to me anything that you can do in KDE, which I haven't got an opportunity to do in GNOME, I'd love to hear it. Because if you can't answer that, then my theory of using the GNOME desktop um, stands true for my for my own.